Today's science lesson, we are going to learn about animal kingdom. Um, when we talk about animal kingdom, uh, scientists have come up with close to 1.7 million spe species that they have been able to identify. There are many living organisms that do exist. And these many living organisms, the scientists have come up and they have tried as much as possible to classify them. So we are saying, for instance, if you go to a supermarket and things have been sorted out, it becomes easier for you to describe and even talk about the living organism on Earth if they are sorted out for you. But it's very difficult for you to talk about the living organism on Earth if the scientists have not assisted you by sorting them out. So we are talking of taxonomists. We had seen that taxonomists are a scientist who classify organisms into groups by using characteristics that are present, that are common among these organisms. That is what the taxonomists do. One group, you know, one group that uh, we know about, we are going to deal with this group, and this group is called the animal kingdom. We shall see how far the taxonomies have gone ahead to classify the organisms that are present in the animal kingdom, what they have done. Now, kingdom, it is the first level of classification that sorts living things into smaller number of groups. Each group has a very large number of organisms in it, and each organism shares important characteristics with others in the group. Kingdom is the name given to the group at the first level of classification. Kingdom is the name given to the, uh, the name given to the group at the first level of classification. Yes, we have said kingdom is the name given to the group at the first level of classification. And we are saying the taxonomists have sorted out all living things into five kingdoms. So I've said these scientists have sorted out living organisms into five uh, kingdoms that uh, we shall look them, but at the moment we shall start with the animal kingdom. One of the kingdom is what we are referring to as the animal kingdom. Examples of animals that are found in these animal kingdoms are just examples of some of the animals that are found within the an animal kingdoms. We have animals like um, like the kangaroos, we have uh, kangaroos uh, that are found in this kingdom. We have snakes. Snakes are found within the animal kingdom. Um, we have lions. We have lions. Uh, giraffes are also found within this animal kingdom. We have bees. We know bees as insects, but insects are also animals that are found within this animal kingdom. We have worms. Worms are also found within this animal uh, kingdom. 
And also we have animals that stay in water. For instance, uh, we have fish. Fish is also found within this animal kingdom. The organisms in the animal kingdom are divided into smaller uh, groups according to the characteristics that are evident within these animals. We are saying the organisms in the animal kingdom are divided into smaller groups according to the characteristics of the animals. So we have what we call animal uh, phyla. When we talk of animal phyla, phyla is a grouping. If it is in singular, we normally say phylum, but in plural, we say phyla. So we are saying animal phyla, animals are often described as vertebrates. Animals are often described as vertebrates. When we say animals are described as vertebrates, these are animals with backbones. So whenever we say animals are described, we can classify animals and say there are animals which have vertebrates and animals which, are, which we call vertebrates are animals with backbones and we have animals that are invertebrates. The invertebrates, they don't have backbones. So we are saying animals are often described as vertebrates, that is animals with backbones or invertebrates, animals without uh, backbones. So we are saying we have animals with the vertebrates and other animals are in vertebrates, they don't have backbones. Although uh, the difference is important, the terms are not often, often used by the taxonomy, those who engage in classify, classification of animals. We cannot just go continue trying to classify animals in terms of whether they have backbones or not. There are other observable characteristics that the taxonomists have come up with when they're trying to classify animals, which we shall look into deeply. We cannot just say because we have simple features, we can be able to tell animals that have vertebrates, that, that have backbones, and others that don't have uh, backbones. We cannot just use that one as the only criteria when we are trying to classify animals. Scientists have made up a number of observations among living things, and uh, the presence and absence of backbone is not the only observation that can be used when we are trying to classify animals. Members of animal kingdoms um, uh, have been grouped in by into, uh, the members of animal kingdoms have been grouped by the taxonomies into nine uh, uh, smaller groups. So we are saying the taxonomists have grouped um, members in the, in the animal kingdom into nine smaller groups. We shall write these nine smaller groups. There are nine smaller groups and uh, these nine, each of the smaller groups is known as phylum. Each of the smaller groups is known as the phylum and in plural is what we call plural is what we call a uh, phyla what we had written the plural is what we call fra, uh, phy, phyla so we are saying the nine phyla are as follows Uh, one, because we are trying to identify these nine uh, phylas within the animal kingdom. 
Therefore, we can have animals. Then, uh, we identify these uh, nine phyla. The first uh, phylum is pol pol polyphyrus. Polyphyrus. So we have polyphyrus, and uh, the second uh, phylum is what you call Cidarians. That is the second phylum, and then uh, the third phylum we call it Echinoderms. We shall later on deal with each phylum as it is represented. So we have the echinoderms, and then we have another phylum uh, called annelids. We have another phylum called annelids, and the annelids has got its own unique uh, characteris characteristics. We have another phylum called the nematodes. The nematodes have got also their own characteristics and structures that are also that differentiates them from other phylums like the annelids and the echinoderms. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five. We have the sixth phylum, and the sixth phylum is called plate. Uh, plate uh, helminths helminths uh, we shall see the characteristics of these plate helminths um, i know it is one of the phylum that is flat it contains uh, flood animals and uh, and so forth we shall see their characteristics and um, we have the seventh phylum as the mol mollusks We shall see the unique uh, characteristic and behavior of the animals found in these groups of mollusks. Then uh, we have another phylum that is very common called uh, arthropods. Now with the arthropods, uh, we know that we have a lot of insects uh, that are present there. They have their own characteristics, their, their body segments and so forth. They have exoskeleton, we shall observe that. Then the, that was the eighth phylum and then the last uh, phylum where we normally have large animals. We have a phylum called Codets. Now the last phylum called Codets is where we have huge and big animals present there, the animals that have the backbones and uh, those who depend on their skeleton, the nerves and so forth, but uh, we shall see uh, what happens on this, the ninth uh, phylum. So these are the ninth uh, groupings that the taxonomists came up with and classified the animal kingdoms, that the animal kingdoms have got these nine smaller groups that have got unique characteristics uh, which can differentiate them from other groups altogether. So we are saying we are saying eight of the animals phyla, uh, phyla above do not have backbones. So we are, what we are saying from anthropods uh, up there until poly poriferas, the eight of them they don't have backbones but when you go to codex they do have uh, backbones. The phylum coated includes all animals with backbones. So we shall start uh, with the first uh, 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 phylum that is Poriferas. Then we shall see the characteristics of these uh, Poriferas.
So, for reference, now for reference, um, that one will be our number one phylum that we are going to study, their characteristics, and we shall observe their uniqueness. These are what, uh, when we talk of poriferans, are commonly called sponges. When you observe the bodies are in spongy form and uh, they live in water and uh, mostly found in marine environment. So when you observe these poriferans, you might not uh, uh, at the first instance when you glance at them, at, when you look at them, you cannot notice immediately that they're animals. But when you observe keenly, you discover these sponges have got some um, openings, and you will discover these sponges, they have some openings, and from these openings, they are able to take in water, and from the water, they can uh, extract food that is present within this water. And when they have taken food, they can leave that food water to pass through once they have extracted the food that is contained in the water. So we are saying they live in water and mostly found in marine environment. They are sponges or proliferants which have more sponges. We are saying they are full of holes and uh, these holes are the ones we are calling maybe spores. They are full of spores uh, which water passes through when, uh, through when they are carrying uh, food. So we are saying they, are, they have ability of filtering food from the water that is passing through the spores they have or the sponges within them. So these spores are able to let water to pass through, but they filter and take food from this water. So we are being told that uh, when we look, the, the major reason why we can term these polyferas as filter feeders. They are also referred as filter we call them filter feeders uh, because they are able to filter food. They are able uh, filter feeders. They are able to filter food from water. They extract food from water and they use it. Then another characteristic of these polyferans uh, is that the waste, uh, the waste that come along, the, this waste is ejected out, is left to go along with water, and it passes through the opening at the top of the sponges. The sponge-like substances that are there, they have more spores, so once they have extracted the food they want, the waste product will be left to move together with water so that it will pass through the spores within the sponge, and they will have, uh, they, they will have extracted the food, they will have uh, uh, I mean, they will have taken in the food that is important for their existence. These are polyferans. They are very p prominent. They are found within water. They occupy marine environment. They have more spores within their bodies. This spongy like body with the spores is able to allow water to pass through them while they are able to filter food and to take this food for their own consumption and for their own use. That was the first group uh, phylum. We can go to the second group, and the second group is called cnidarians. We want to see the character characteristics of these cnidarians. Now, with the cnidarians, uh, we have animals that are uh, famously found in this phylum, we have the jellyfish. Jellyfish is an example of an animal that belongs to this group of animal kingdom or a phylum uh, called uh, cnidarian. So apart from jellyfish, we have the sea anemones. We have the sea anemones that are also present here, and we have the co coral, coral uh, polyps. Coral polyps are also 
in this group of cedarians, polyps, uh, when these uh, coral polyps die, they form the coral reefs, reefs that we know of. Also, other animals that are in this group, apart from the polyps, uh, yes, polyps belong here. And also, there is a one way, there's another way that we can be able, another characteristic that is dominant and we can associate with this uh, group of cnidarians or this phylum. Uh, they have radiosymmetry uh, and only one body opening. So we are saying, unlike the uh, peripherians, when we come to cnidarians, they have got only one opening. That one opening uh, they have, they will use it, they will take in food from that one opening and the same, same one opening will be used also to ingest out to remove the waste product uh, from their body. So when we talk of radio symmetry, it is a way, if you decide to divide these uh, cnidarians into equal parts, then uh, at any line, that any line that you will be able to dissect this animal will have two equal parts, but we talk, they have what we call radio symmetry. There are several lines that when you cut across, we can still find uh, equal uh, parts. Radio symmetry, and uh, we shall have an example later on to explain what radio symmetry. Because these animals, some of them fall into radio symmetry. You can subdivide a number of them, and still they give exactly the, the same as the other part. We have others which are uh, bilateral symmetry, whereby you have got only one way. You divide once, and uh, once you divide once, uh, there's no other way you can divide and and be able to tell that. Uh, it is uh, exactly replica to the other half. So on this, uh, so we are saying food, food goes into the body through this one opening that uh, is found among these sidereans. It has got only one opening, and the same opening is used also when they are uh, uh, eject, e ejecting out the waste products. The same, same opening is used. So we are told sidereans have a stinging cell. They have stinging cells which they must use to catch fish. Centurions are not interested in uh, um, using human beings as food, but their sting causes intense pain and sometimes they can kill animals. They can kill animals. They can also kill human beings because they, their stings produce a very tough poison. And the tough poison that is produced by these uh, stings can be able to cause heart attack to a number of animals. And if you are a human being and you get entangled in the tender course, they can also cause a heart attack on you and you might die. For instance, we are told those who have done maybe uh, uh, a number of statistics that have come up that uh, these, these uh, uh, sedarians are responsible for close to 100 deaths that uh, affects human being within the country. So they are dangerous. If you get entangled in their tentacles, they are very poisonous, they will sting you and uh, poison you and you can easily die. We shall have an example of, uh, an example of a jellyfish so that uh, we see how this animal looks. Jellyfish is an animal that looks like this way and it has got its tender cause. So whenever we are talking about the tender cause, we are talking these uh, tall elongated things. This is the jellyfish, which has the tender cause, and we have said these tender cause are poisonous. So once you get entangled in these tender cause, they will sting you and give you uh, inject you with the poison and we have said the poison is uh, dangerous it can cause a number of deaths what the poison does it attacks the heart and causes a heart attack among human beings and also the animal in the seas uh, that is uh, that was number two second group we can go to a third uh, uh, phylum and the third phylum is called the echino, echinoderms, 
we want to see how the characteristics of echinoderms, how the echinoderms are, uh, what kind of characteristics they have, and the structures they have, and how they behave. So we shall go to our third uh, phylum, and our third phylum in the animal kingdom, we shall deal with the echinoderms. So echinoderms, this is, this is a third grouping. Uh, on the, and on the echinoderms, we are told examples of animals that are present among the echinoderms. We have examples of animals that belong to this phylum as the starfish. A starfish belongs to this group. We have also the predal star. Uh, brittle star is also another uh, animal that is present, uh, that falls under this phylum, the echinoderms. We also have the sea archins. We have the sea archins. The sea archins also belong to this group of echinoderms. And um, we have also the sea cucumbers. The sea cucumbers also belong to this uh, group of echinoderms. They, are all, they all live in the ocean, often near the coast. So we are saying this group of uh, uh, animals, the echinoderms, we are so, uh, saying they are found within the seas, and we are saying if they are present in the oceans, then they are located towards the coastal area towards the coast is where the presence is highly felt. So the starfish, the predal uh, star, and the sea urchins have this pinny skin. We are told another characteristics that affect these echinoderms, they have a spinny skin, but, this, the, the, but the skin of sea cucumbers is uh, leathery. The skin of the sea cucumbers is leathery. The other uh, skins of these other three uh, animals, the starfish, the brittle star, and the sea urchins, it is spinny skin, but the skin of the sea cucumber is leathery, um, is leathery. And um, one, of the, the, one of the common things that unites all the echinoderms is that they have radio symmetry. They have radio symmetry, and uh, when we talk of radio symmetry, meaning um, their bodies can be subdivided in different ways and still the whatever symmetry, whatever symmetry, whatever, whatever way you are going to dissect them, they are going to look alike the other uh, uh, half that is the other side. So we are being told that uh, what brings these uh, chinoderms together is they have radio symmetry, so you can subdivide it in different various ways. We shall, I will later on dis uh, demonstrate that. They are, we are told that uh, echinoderms are over um, six, we have over 6,000 species of echinoderms. So there are many species of echinoderms. There are close to 600, 6,000 living organisms that uh, belong to this phylum of echinoderms. Uh, all echinoderms have a chalky layer under all the echinoderms have got a chalky layer under their skin which forms a protective cover or a protective armor. We are told all the echinoderms have got a, a chalky layer that protects them. Now we want uh, to talk about uh, a sim symmetry in organisms so that when we talk of radio symmetry or bilateral symmetry we can at least understand what, what the implications are. When we talk of symmetry in organisms, uh, we shall finish the symmetry and then we shall continue with the analytes, but let us talk about symmetry in organisms. Now, symmetry in organisms we say that organisms 
are often described as having radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry. We are saying an organism can be described as having radial symmetry Yes, it can be described as having radial symmetry or bilateral symmetry. So we shall endeavor, we shall try to differentiate the two uh, types of symmetry so that as we continue with other phylums like the annelids and nematodes, we can understand when we say yes, the nematodes fall into this bilateral symmetry or they are within the radial symmetry we can understand. So when we talk of uh, radial symmetry, uh, what do we mean? Uh, when we talk of radial symmetry, we are saying any cut in any direction. With the radial symmetry, we are saying any cut in any direction through the middle uh, will result into identical halves. Any cut of any cut, we are saying any cut in any direction through the middle of that particular organism will result into identical halves. So when you cut through the middle, you will get any cut, you will get identical halves. So the, you cut as long as you are passing through the center or the middle of that particular organism, then the, you are going to get to end up with identical halves. And uh, if you end up with identical halves, is what we term uh, such a, a kind as a radial symmetry. So we are saying radial symmetry. Any cut in any direction through the middle of that organism will result into identical halves. And maybe the better example we can illustrate this. We can use our our starfish to demonstrate uh, what we are talking about radial symmetry. A starfish resembles a star. Um, our drawings are not uh, very much up to the scale, but uh, we can try to improve. Um, this is a starfish. As you can see, it has got its tentacles. It looks like a, a star. So when we are talking about uh, radial symmetry, if this is the middle and we are saying a line that passes, so we can have one line passing through the middle. So we say uh, this half will be exactly like that other, and we can have another line passing through the middle, and this half will be exactly like the other one. We can have another line cutting in the middle that way, and this half will be exactly like the other half, and. Uh, we can have another half uh, line passing through the center again this way. Then this half is exactly like the other half. And uh, we can have another line from this passing through this way. And we shall say this half is also like the other half. So we are seeing it is symmetrical. Each line, as long as it's going through the center and you going through this uh, living organism, the other side will be equal and identical to the other. So when you talk of any cut, any direction through the middle will result into identical halves. Whether you cut it this way, whether you cut it this way, as long as you are going through the middle, then the other half will be exactly replica, identical to the other. That is what, uh, why, that's why what we, when we talk about uh, 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 radio symmetry, we say organisms that you can be able to subdivide so many times and still they are getting a replica or an identical half. We call them, the, that, that they qualify 
they, they can be able to describe. We can now use radio symmetry as part of the characteristics that these animals can qualify into. Whichever way you cut a starfish, it will, it will come, it will show same identical halves. So we are saying that one is radio uh, symmetry. Now we want to advance to bilateral symmetry and uh, we want to see what bilateral symmetry is. And uh, we shall use an animal that can give a good example of what bilateral symmetry is. Now, bilateral symmetry, we can take maybe a human being. If you take a human being, uh, there, there is only one way you can divide a human being so that uh, if this human being uh, comes up with the two halves, these two halves should be exactly identical and replica to the other half. So we can have an example of a, a caricature of a human being. We shall see whether that one will be the head and where the hands would be and where the legs would be, for instance. Uh, this is a caricature of a human being it looks like a human being. Maybe when we want the two halves, we can imagine that uh, this human being has at least uh, some eyes and the nose might be somewhere also there. So when we talk of bilateral symmetry, we can say there is only one way we can subdivide a human being into two equal halves that are identical and replica to each other. And there's only one way, no two ways. That's why I say it is bilateral. Human being, you can qualify as a bilateral organism, but not symmetrical. So if we cut, uh, if we, we cut this human being, for instance, it's a caricature, we cut in the middle this way. Uh, we are saying that is our line. We are uh, bisecting. We are saying this, uh, uh, this side is ex exactly identical to other side because you are cutting in the middle of this uh, caricature of a human being. So they look alike. So we say human beings, if we give an example, human beings can qualify as, as being uh, a bilateral symmetry, they qualify. When we, we can describe them using bilateral symmetry, meaning we can cut a human being into two equal halves that are identical. This is bilateral. So it is unlike the, st the starfish where we could uh, dissect the starfish in different ways and still it becomes uh, uh, extremely identical with the other. So we have explained what uh, radial symmetry is and we have explained what bilateral symmetry is. Now we can go to our fourth groupings of uh, we are through with the uh, 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 echinoderms, we can go to, our, to the fourth classification, and the fourth classifications are the annelids. We want to see the characteristics that are uh, evident within the annelids. The most uh, familiar annelid is the earthworm. The most familiar annelid is the earthworm. Most of the annelids, you can use them maybe when uh, you want uh, to fish. You can use, you can place them on the, bay, on the hooks and they come as, as baits and you continue catching fish and so forth. So the most familiar annelid is the earthworm. Other annelids uh, are like leeches and ragworm. We have leeches and uh, uh, ragworms. We are told ragworms are the best uh, baits that are normally used when uh, they are trying to, 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 to catch fish. You can have hooks, you put these uh, uh, ragworms or the other worms and then you can be able to, to, to bait. You can be able to cheat fish and the fish will think that it is normal food. But uh, under the ringworm you have hidden your hook and you can be able to capture fish. So we are told this way concerning the annelids. Annelids have rings along the, its length, 
or its body. So we are told annelids, when you check the worms the way they are, you will find when you observe them closely, it's as if they have some rings or some segments uh, they appear within their body. These rings or segments uh, or some divisions within the body and the group, they, 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 are common, they, they have a common name called segmented worms. So the annelids, the animals within the phylum of annelids are also called the segmented worms. They are called segmented worms because of the segments or the ring-like structures that are seen within the body lengths. When you observe, you see some rings. So they are called segmented worms. These animals have bilateral symmetry, meaning if you want to divide them into equal halves that are identical, we can only divide them once. And then the other half will be exactly replica like the other halves. It cannot qualify when it comes to radio symmetry. No, the analysts will not qualify. So we are saying these animals are bilateral uh, symmetry. They can sh be able to be subdivided into two equal parts. The analysts are found in water and damp places like land. So when you go to land, when you are looking them within the land, the soils where it's wet, you can easily uh, find these analysts you can get them. Annelids have two body openings, that is another characteristic, uh, one in front and the, and, uh, the other one, um, so the one in front is where the food enters and another one back where the f wastes live. So we are saying annelids and like uh, the, the uh, uh, echinoderms where they have got only maybe one opening, they ingest the food and also they ingest the food from the same openings. We are being told the analysts have got two openings. One in front where the food enters the body and where the waste products leaves the body, then uh, that is, uh, the, the waste product leaves the body, that is from the back. So they leave the body. An example of uh, when we are talking about these worms, maybe a slight uh, representation of what other worms are. They have segments, we say yes. Um, 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 I, uh, this is just uh, an example of what uh, an other worm um, might look like. What we are seeing, this part where we have this clear division, it points the head and the other side is the tail. These are the worms that are found uh, very often in soils where there's water, where the soils, where we have uh, places that are damp places in land, we can find the other worms. Uh, now from these uh, annelids, we can go to another group of phyla, uh, phylum called the nematodes. Uh, and that is a group number five, nematodes. Now these phylum nematodes are famous uh, for a number of things. One, we can say nematodes are, uh, most nematodes are round worms. Nematodes are round worms. They have bilateral symmetry, meaning you can be able to uh, bisect them into two equal parts. So we are saying nematodes are round worms. They, can, they have bilateral symmetry. They can be subdivided into two. And like the annelids, which has long tabard, they have long tabard bodies which are pointed at the end. The other worms are different, but these ones are pointed at the end. We are told they are pointed at the end, but they do not have segments. So within their bodies, the round worms, they do not have the segments within their body. 
we are told about the nematodes are uh, commonly, uh, commonly found in damp soils, water. So nematodes, they are habi uh, habitat areas that are found in damp soils, damp soils. We are also told that uh, they are found in water, uh, water. And uh, another unique characteristic uh, with the nematodes or roundworms, they are parasites. What we mean is, uh, apart from existing in dumpy soils and in water, they have ability also of existing on, on some animals. They can exist on top of some animals. And these animals that they can exist on top of them are called hosts. They will depend on these particular hosts for food, shelter, and everything. They can also exist within these uh, particular hosts, but within their bodies. So there are parasites, they will feed on that host, particular organism called host, and they can harm it. So when we talk of uh, uh, roundworms being parasites, and they are living on other living organisms, you will find that when you talk of relationship between these parasites called the nematodes or the roundworms, it will be feeding upon these hosts while the host is not gaining anything. So in the end, it can harm the host and even kill it. So we are saying the nematodes can, are parasitic the organisms. They live on other organisms, and this, they live on other organisms called the host. They get the food from the host, but in return, the host gets nothing. Uh, this is very interesting. So uh, nematodes or roundworms are known to be found in the hearts of some animals. Yes, they can be found within the hearts uh, of some animals, and when they are found within the heart, then we shall call them heartworms. If they are found within the heart, they are heartworms. And what we are told that uh, most heartworms are found within the dog, so they can live very well within dogs, and uh, if the dog is not treated uh, uh, immediately, they can end up harming that particular dog, even the dog can die. But if you give it a, a proper uh, pesticide and so forth, then you can do, do away with these heartworms that have decided to use the heart of a particular dog as its habitat. So we are told that uh, heartworms, are, they, heartworms normally cause disease to dogs, and the, these dogs, the disease that affect them, that normally affected by the nematodes, whatever nature of the nematodes that affect them. Even human beings, we are also told, we can also become host to these parasitic nematodes. So we are saying nematodes or the roundworms do not only affect the dogs, no. We are saying apart from the dogs, even human beings can be affected. So human beings who love uh, pets call dogs so much and they play with them, if these dogs are affected by the roundworms or the, the nematodes, there is a likelihood also that a human being, you can become a parasite, they can affect you, and if you are not treated, then uh, you will be sick. You might also die. We don't know whether they will affect your heart, but we have been told the nematodes can also affect us. Uh, we shall go to the six uh, phylum, the six grouping or phylum called uh, the platyhelminthes. Uh, these six groupings, uh, these are animals which are flat, but uh, they have their own unique characteristic. Platyhelminthes. Helminthes, helminthes, they have uh, a unique characteristics. We are told plate helminthes are flat worms. They are worms, but they are flat. They are not round, flat worms. They are flat worms, they have bilateral symmetry, meaning if you are to divide uh, uh, these uh, flat worms, you can be able to subdivide the Final plant help mean, mean this into two equal halves, not uh, radio symmetry. They don't qualify there, but they can be subdivided into two equal parts. Uh, their bodies are flat, and that's why they are called flat worms uh, at the bottom. They live in water and moist 
places. So the area, the area of habitation is water. They will be found in water and moist areas. Moist areas. So you cannot find flatworms in an area where there is absence of water. No, they cannot exist in places where water is not available. So we are told about these uh, flatworms. They are about 12 species of flatworms. So the scientists have come up with close to 12,000 species of flatworms or platyhelminths. So there are so many. So when you are trying to study them, know that you will deal with a, a large number of species. Some are uh, uh, some some of these uh, flatworms are found within oceans. Others are found within waterways, and uh, some of them feed on uh, microscopic plants. But many of these uh, flatworms are parasites, meaning they have. Uh, a host organisms where these flatworms will attach themselves and feed themselves and so forth. So we are being told that uh, there, are many, there, are, there are many and uh, they are found in areas where there are wastes. They can be used as uh, decomposers. They can, they, 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 they can eat waste uh, product. They can, deal, they can be used as decomposers. They can feed on waste product and their presence is highly felt in oceans and waterways. And some of them feed on microscopic plants, but many are parasites. These are the flatworms. So if I was to draw a representation, uh, it becomes difficult. But what we know about the uh, flatworms, they are normally flat. And if we cut them, we can cut them into two equal parts. Let us go to this other group of mol mollusks. And uh, that is the seventh phylum and uh, we shall observe it is unique characteristics of the mollusk. Now when uh, we are talking about mollusks, mollusks are members of the second largest phylum in animal kingdom. We are saying there are many members that uh, belong to this group of mollusks. So mollusks are members of the second largest, largest phylum in the animal kingdom. And uh, here we have our friends, uh, animals like snails. Snails uh, belong to this grouping or belong to this phylum. Mollusks, we have snails. We have uh, slugs, which looks like snails. Maybe there's a slight difference between slugs and snails. Uh, Snails are those uh, which have their shells, and uh, those who don't have their shells, then such organism we can call them the slugs. We have slugs and oysters, yes. Oysters are also organisms that are present within uh, this uh, grouping. We also uh, have uh, uh, mussels, those who belong here. We have these organisms called mussels. They just look that, like oysters. They also belong to this group. They come with a variety of shapes. We are told uh, animals in this group of mollusks, they have a variety of shapes. Snails have got many uh, various kinds of snails and slugs in the same way. So they come with a variety of shapes and sizes, but all, all of them, they qualify and they fall under bilateral symmetry. So we can subdivide, subdivide them into two equal parts, but they cannot fall under their uh, radio symmetry, but bilateral symmetry. They have well developed, yeah, they have well uh, developed uh, internal organs, and uh, they have muscular, uh, uh, um, use, uh, move. they have muscular uh, legs when they want to move. They can move easily. They have well-developed uh, internal organs. Uh, some of the mollusks uh, have a shell to protect them. Some mollusks have the shells. 
Like for instance, when talk of snail, you find that it has the shell, so that when in case it's being attacked, it can retreat back to its shell and therefore uh, the shell protecting it. Um, let us go uh, to the next group when we are through with the molars where the snails belong. We can go to the next group of uh, the anthropods, that is uh, the age uh, phyla of animal kingdom. Arthropods, and on the arthropods, we are told uh, one, anthropods uh, form the largest animal uh, phylum with over a million species described. So we are told uh, close to they have over one million species. So in case you want to classify, then you have a lot of work to deal with. But scientists have come up with over one million species of anthropods. This phylum include, this phylum include, we want to see what kind of animals belong to this phylum, the animals that we meet uh, uh, in day-to-day -day activities. We have animals called insects. Insects belong to this phylum of anthropods, and uh, insects were used to them. When they talk about their structure and shapes, we also know that uh, insects have, have uh, they have three, uh, their bodies are divided into three, uh, seg three body parts and so forth. Also another group of anthropods, we have scorpions and spiders. They also fall under this category of anthropods, scorpions. Scorpions um, are present and also we have spiders. Mm. Yes. Uh, they, they have stings, they can bite, they are poisonous. So we are saying scorpions and spiders are some of the animals that are found within the anthropods. And then uh, uh, another group uh, that is found here within the anthropods, we have the crustaceans. We have the crustaceans and uh, crustaceans are among these phylum of anthropods. Uh, they're like pawns or the, the, the crabs, crustaceans, we have crabs in this group. Crabs uh, belong here. Uh, we have uh, lobsters. Lobsters as crustaceans, they are in this group. Um, we have our friend, uh, the millibeds also. Millibeds also belong to this group of uh, uh, crustaceans. Uh, these are examples of some of the anthropods. What we know about anthropods, they are found everywhere. Anthropods are found everywhere, on land, on air, in water, because they have waterproof exoskeleton. Exoskeleton is a skeleton on the outside of the body. The skeleton does not bend so the limbs of the anthropods or legs and the antenna are jointed to allow animals to move. Inside the body, it is the body of an anthropod is subdivided into segments. These are sometimes visible lines that you can be able to see across the exoskeleton. Uh, now, when we are through with the anthropods, we have seen examples of anthropods, insects and so forth. We are now, uh, uh, looking the last part of the cortex and uh, about uh, this uh, we are going to end there on the cortex which is the last and the ninth phylum. What I would like to mention about the cortex as we conclude we shall see, we see that the cortex are the largest the largest animals, the biggest animals belong to these uh, cortex and uh, they can be described as vertebrates because they have uh, the, the backbones and so forth. So what we are going to see because this cortex has got its own groupings and we shall deal with the groupings uh, which <laughs> has a lot of information, uh, I would like us to end 
our lesson today on cortex, which is another, the last phylum among the animal kingdom, so that in the next lesson, we shall pick on from the cortex, and the cortex here is where we have human being, the elephant, the dogs, they belong to this category or to this phylum of animal kingdom. So the cortex, we shall continue in our next lesson to see the different groupings within the cortex that are there. And for this lesson, let us end there. Thank you very much.